Yeah, so I'll be giving a talk uh, on our journey to the cloud uh, for our high-performance computing systems. Uh, I'm a senior cloud architect and also currently uh, I'm managing the research computing at the University of Bath. So for who doesn't know the University of Bath, that's a picture on the side. We're a public research university with a strong focus on technology and science. We're consistently one of the top 10 universities in the United Kingdom. And just one stats, we have 20,000 students from 147 nationalities. So um, on-premise high performance computing presents quite a few challenges. Uh, you need to basically have a replacement every six or seven year. you need years that means you have to go out to tender and uh, you have a system and once you get it it's a fixed system normally it starts out to be a little bit old as well because you don't want to buy the very latest technology because you're you will want something that's going to be stable so it's already as soon as you buy it, it's already aging you have limited resources which means that the you have quite a long the queue Basically, your users have quite long queues to wait to run their uh, workloads. Hence, we're, uh, this, the, that's slowing down the research. And uh, the research requirements uh, are always coming in, uh, basically evolving at pace. We always have new requirements and our system is basically old. On-premise systems are old. So they, don't, they can't keep the pace, basically, yeah. So uh, we have, as our university has an ambitious research agenda. So we want to have cutting edge computational facilities to meet, to meet the, the research demands of our staff. We want a flexible and scalable uh, resources that can change upon the needs of our users. So that can uh, follow these demands. Uh, we want to grow our user base. So we want to have all our users engaging with our systems. Uh, so, and uh, we want to, so we want to, uh, so overall we want to increase the capabilities and productivity of our researchers. Uh, so we see that cloud can turbocharge research. And why is that the case? Well, uh, the cloud offers highly flexible and on-demand computing that you can use when you need it. Uh, the computational environments in the cloud evolve, they're always evolving. You always have the latest uh, facilities, latest compute, compute nodes and uh, so forth. Uh, so basically, yes, so the cloud is normally, uh, is always uh, modern, up to date and cutting edge. Uh, the cloud is co cost optimized, so there's a lot of work behind that to make the solutions optimized for the cost. And uh, to a certain extent, there's also that also increases the cost of transparency. Everything is kind of, well, the users can go online and see how much the stuff costs. So it's, uh, it's, really, it's quite transparent. So uh, we've offered, uh, we're offering a portfolio of research computing resources. Uh, some of them uh, we've are cloud-based, so we moved into the cloud. Uh, so we have a, a high-performance computing teaching environment, which was actually the first one we rolled out. And uh, we have a phase one and phase two systems, and I'll explain that a little bit uh, in the following slide. So we have a Jana system and an Imba system. And then we have a couple of on uh, then we have some on-prem systems that we're still offering. Uh, we have a small system, which is called, which is a high throughput computing system, which we call Anatra. Uh, that's mainly for software that has restricted, we cannot be used in the cloud. Well, we haven't really found many cases of that, actually. And then we have a great Western, well, we have basically a tier two system. Tier two is a, U, is a high performance computing system, which is a local regional system in the United Kingdom, which is called Isambard. So our cloud solution is based on quite a lot of different elements and technologies. So we are members of the OCRA, the Open Cloud for Research Environments, which gives us uh, a discount. We are, uh, our distributor, which we inter interact with is, is Phoenix. It's a software company in the United Kingdom. Uh, our infrastructure is based on Microsoft Azure. 
We use uh, Microsoft DevOps, Azure DevOps, to do our deployments. We're using Easy Build, which is our soft to uh, is a software deployment tool to uh, deploy software on the clusters. We're using CycleCloud, which is a, is an, uh, uh, an orchestrator, um, a cloud orchestrator to deploy to manage the resources. And we're using Slurm, which is a workload manager. It's a, it's a tool to basically allow users to submit jobs into a high performance computing system. So I mentioned about these phases. So we are, we've decided to move our cloud, uh, our HPC into the cloud in uh, different phases. So phase one, which I'll mention in the next slides, and we mentioned is our JANA system. And it was kind of a, late, a lightweight cloud environment for selective user groups. Daniel was one of the users. So he will describe uh, some research he's done there. And uh, the phase two is what we call Nimbus. And it's a more functional, a resilient platform, which mirrors our on-prem system, which is called Balena, has cost controls and has full software stack. So we have all the software. One challenge that university have compared to industry is that we have a, more, a greater variety of software that we offer to our customers. And then we, uh, then we, in, then we envisage a phase three, where we want to try to target non-traditional high-performance computing groups, and also optimizing and tuning the environment to the user's needs. So I described, so yeah, so Janus is our high-performance computing system. It's a phase one system. So uh, you're probably all familiar with this, but basically nodes are not physical in the system. They're virtual nodes. So, so although we're offering 800 compute nodes in the system, we only charge if we use them. So if these nodes get, we, we, terminology spun up, they get assigned to us, then we get charged. As I mentioned, the resources are managed, orchestrated by uh, Azure Cycle Cloud, which is an Azure product. Users access via SSH onto a login node. There's a login node, a scheduler node. They, then they will basically submit their jobs using Slurm. And as you see, one concern here is that we have only a single login node, scheduler node, which is basically a single point of failure. So in our Nimbus cluster, in our Nimbus system, we decided to take some learnings from our Janus platform. Uh, one of the main things is to improve the resilience of the system overall. Then we, uh, so we've introduced a new cycle, a new life cycle model to guarantee maximum availability, which I'll discuss later on. We've introducing more monitoring on the cluster to, to ensure that uh, we know what's going on and everything is monitored. And that's via what we call the TIG stack. We are, we, we've implemented uh, new cost, cost control management tools because uh, we want to tightly, uh, this is what we had on our on-prem system. We want to monitor costs and, uh, and uh, of, of the cluster down to the user level, basically. And then we've introduced a couple of more storage options, which I'll discuss as well in the next slide, one of the next slides. So one of the main interesting aspects, and we're kind of a little bit forced to create this, is we've developed an accounting portal the counting portal allows users, uh, what we, well, allow, allows basically the budget holders to manage their budget. So they can view the budgets assigned to the accounts and they can uh, allocate resources, compute and storage to the accounts. This is, a, this is the picture. So users can see what their spend is. It's a, it's, this is an indicative picture. They can see what their budget is, what their uh, account allocations are. And they can assign resources. They will have different kinds of accounts. And so in this way, they can monitor. They can assign users to their projects. So they can see. And they can self, self, it's a self-service system where they can manage the, everything from their end. And it's proven to be quite useful. And our users are really loving it, actually. So in terms of high availability, our first JANA system was not highly available due to limitations, actually, with recycle cloud but these were fixed so now we have uh, we have uh, multiple scheduler nodes multiple login nodes the login nodes are accessed via ssh so the user can uh, uh, still access it but it's, there's more resilience so we still have the compute nodes and as i said we have this accounting portal 
which is basically a web browser interface, which the users access via HTTPS. So we've introduced uh, many, many more metrics, and we're using what we call the TIG stack. It's the Telegraph, InfluxDB, and Grafana uh, stack. And this will this will catch uh, monitor. This will monitor the databases, the, all the nodes in the system. We're actually monitoring our Anatron prem system, uh, everything basically. And we, all these all these uh, logs are collected, and so system administrators can uh, uh, understand how the system is performing and what is going on. And in future, we we plan to offer this. Some selectric dashboards will be offered to our users for full transparency, so they can also see what's going on on the system. We also want to open up access to the system so um, users don't have to uh, be some Linux expert. You know, SSH sometimes can be a barrier to the users. So there's this uh, quite, uh, we, we like it a lot, this open demand tool that we offer. It's, kind of, it's based on a web, web interface and it, so it, work on, it can work on a mobile phone, it can work on a tablet. Users basically can submit jobs to the cluster, create uh, access their files, or all, all via web interface. So they don't have to really understand the intricacies of Linux. And we're also running remote visualizations via this, this portal. And we will also offer in future other features like metrics and further on. So it's a kind of a what we call a single point access to the cluster. So storage is very, very well, it's quite complex currently in the cloud, maybe it's maybe more so than on-prem. Uh, storage, the, the cost of storage is based on the performance. So, and to increase the performance, you have to increase the capacity, which, which means that <laughs> you have to pay more for it. So the, the way we've kind of, we're intending to crack this, this problem is to inf it, it offer storage in a tiering model. So you have, some less performance storage, which is tier three, and there's there's more of it, so it has higher capacity. Then you have a tier two storage, which is uh, a bit more expensive, a bit more performant, but there's not much, there's less of it. And then you hear tier, tier one storage, which is really super performant, and the users who need the performance can access it, but there's gonna be less of it. So this this, this means that it has to be a bit of a workflow where users move their, move their data between different types of storages, but this can be automated. So uh, in, uh, it, it's not such of a concern. And this gives a little bit of a picture again. So yeah, so storage is visible and it's connected and everything can, all the, all the relevant parts can access the storage. We're calling it scratch campaign and shelving, but these are just names that we've given it. You can uh, choose, uh, these are just reference names. Yeah, so the compute is also, well, offers uh, challenges, and but also possibilities. There's many, many, many different types of computes. Azure offers more than 400 types of computes. So there's pay-as-you-go compute, there's spot compute, there's reserved instance compute, there's compute optimized, memory optimized, different kinds of processors, Cores go from, uh, on our cluster, we have nodes that go from one core to 120 cores. There's uh, RDMA, so you can have basically fast network connection between the nodes. Some of them do, some of them do not. Some have GPUs, some do not. Some have up to eight GPUs, some have one GPU. So it's important to strike a little bit of a balance. And we're offering, uh, we're offering 42 different instances on the cluster. And uh, just, I just want to highlight the spot instances. Spot instances uh, are, spot is basically spare capacity, which is available in the cloud and is offered at a highly discounted rates. So it can be 80% cheaper than pay as you go. Uh, but the, the offer, spot offers a, a bit of a challenge though, that you can be evicted if somebody who else who is paying, who's using pay as you go wants to use it. So it's very good for certain workloads, but it's not good for everything, but it offers possibilities to users. So as I mentioned, uh, if a user is basically, uh, he's logged onto the system, he's got a bunch of nodes, and you have a spot eviction, this node will not be, be available anymore, and the whole workload will uh, possibly fail. So it's very important with the cloud to have the possibility of what we called 
checkpointing your software so your software can restart from a known state. And possibly it's very important, and we're doing this, informing our users when a job gets evicted, so handling the error. So look, you had a spot instance, you've been evicted, and also the charging. This affects also charging, how the, how the nodes are charged. And this is all built in our charging model and our system. And we, uh, we will be providing uh, eviction rates to our users so they know each node how much has been evicted. Eviction rates are on a geographical basis, but uh, we prefer, yeah, we also, we're going to basically offer, uh, uh, yeah, uh, eviction rates to our users based on our usage. So everything I've described to you is implemented using what is known as the DevOps model, so where you have develop, developers, operations, people working together. So everything is written infrastructure as code. Everything is deployed via what we, with this product, which is called Azure DevOps. So we can create our Janus cluster, to give an idea, can be created and destroyed in less than an hour. We can destroy it in 50 minutes. It's a cluster with 100 nodes, potentially. It can be dis disappearing. In the images take a little bit longer. The images take maybe up to 30 minutes to create an image, but you're not constantly creating new images. The image creation is a step that is, uh, is, happens less self, more seldomly. As I mentioned, the cloud is high velocity. The change in the cloud is basically at, goes at high velocity. Things always change very, very quickly. So it's very important to be able to keep up the pace. Traditional HPC are designed for, you, you buy it, you keep it there for seven years, and then you throw it away. But uh, so in the cloud, we've come up with this kind of blue-green deployment model, which is a model typical for web apps. So we've managed to kind of port it into the HPC world. So what happens is that when we have a new feature coming in or patches that need to be provided, we have basically, we have two views of the cluster. We have the view in uh, production and the view, which is the new view. This allows to minimize disruption and downtime and also offers the ability to roll back features if something goes wrong in production. This gives a little bit of a view, a bit more of a view. So you have your users which are logging in. You have a, a pre-release environment which gets promoted to your stable environment. And then you have your, your stable environment which gets retired and it disappears. So new features can be rolled in quite quickly. And there's minimal disruption to the user's uh, workflow. Oops, sorry, wrong way. <clears throat> now I'm moving on to the feedback. So we've had Reasonably, we've had positive uh, feedback from our users. We have much larger calls that we could offer on-prem, so the execution times are faster. Uh, we had we had execution limits on on-prem system. Well, in the cloud, uh, we can do away with execution limits. The cloud is very there's quite a lot of capacity in the cloud, so you don't users don't have to wait. There's a really big diversity, like I said, in storage options, compute instances. We're offering 42 compute instances, but we could easy increase to 60. Uh, the results basically uh, can come back faster. And so there's, because there's, uh, there's, there's basically potentially no queuing time. Um, so the user can choose the best instance to fit his workload. So if he needs one core node, he can choose a one core node. If he needs a, a compute with 120 core nodes, he will select 120 core nodes. So it fits, he can, so on-prem, we just had a couple of sizes. So you had users using a 16-core uh, compute system, if you only, or, or, but you only need one core. So there's wastage there. And uh, yeah, so uh, yeah. And then of course, we always, we're giving, uh, we're supporting our users and we're trying to identify uh, what, how to help the users and identify any issues. This is really important basically when you do migration of users to uh, the new, we did migration of users to the new system. As I said, the way we designed it, this is, this is a little bit because of the way we designed it, the, the, the transfer onto the new system is being seamless. The, use, the, the environments are reasonably similar, the way we work, but this is a design choice that we made uh, for this purpose. Uh, so the fact that the, that the environment is more cutting edge is leading our users to do more, um, to be more ambitious and to put in more ambitious plans in their proposals. And uh, the software is running well, as expected. We're not having issues with running software. We're running licensed software here in the cloud. So we, 
which is something that I, I just I glossed over. But yeah, we're also running licensed software, and uh, we're monitoring uh, the jobs. The job, the monitoring of jobs is easy, user friendly, a little bit, pretty much as as before on that on that front. So a few lessons learned, and some advice maybe that I can uh, provide to you to everybody. So yeah, so this has to be basically a journey between you and your users. So we started actually quite a long time ago. We started our journey three years ago, actually. And uh, so take your users on the journey with you. Don't just impose it out of the blue. You say, tomorrow we have a cloud system and this is the way it's gonna work. So we involved our users. We had an early access. We had a pilot project, which Daniel was involved in. And we, we got some feedback from the users and are you liking it? We got some, uh, what would you like to change? And so we did various, various steps. Hence our phase process approach to, the, to this whole process. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we involve your users in the decision making and get them excited. Uh, so speak to them. What would you like to see? I mean, what would you? So yeah. So keep them always engaged. We we send out lots of com constantly comms. Uh, we the project was managed by a, we had a comms person in the project. We had a project management team in a project manager dedicated to this project. Keep. Keep uh, monitoring your costs. This is also very important. It's a different cost model. Everything is a little bit different. So keep always monitoring your costs. We've designed the portal specifically for that, where users can monitor constantly their costs. Uh, notice that there's a little bit of delay in reporting uh, in Azure. There's Azure reports the costs every 24 hours. And actually, we found out that actually there's a few days delay at the end of the month where stuff trickles in. You have to wait maybe sometimes up to five days you have to wait for everything to trickle in. So, uh, like I said, so the costing is, uh, like I said, so the costing from Azure is not real time. Yeah. And also another important thing is directly map your true cost to your scheduler costs to see how much you're, you're spending and keep everything aligned to keep costs under, in, under control. Uh, another another important thing, if you are using Spot, monitor and review the impacts from evictions. Like I said, we're providing eviction rates, we're providing feedback to our users if there was an eviction, and we've had to do some specific things to do this. This is not provided by the, the cloud provider, so it's something we've, we've had to put in place. The main thing is nothing is static in the cloud. Things are constantly changing, always changing. There's constant change. Uh, I deployed another system a few days ago, and I realized when I deployed it that they changed something, changed the background, and one of the deployment parts failed, and I had to fix it. Hence, it's very important to have all the DevOps platform, so you have everything really under control, and there's nothing manual, you can keep everything, everything is tightly under control. And uh, yeah, get to know your how your existing systems work your storage performance needs, your data churn, your network performance, I'd say as well. And uh, before you do any migration, understand your current system before you do any migration. We gathered, we, on a, we were lucky that we had on our on-prem system, we had lots and lots of metrics that we can leverage to understand what our users needs were before doing any, any migration. And now a few of the challenges that we faced. So, there's, we have, like I said, we, there's much more parallelization now in the cloud. Potentially, you can have 100 nodes, 200 nodes, <laughs> 500 nodes, depending on your workload. These, these nodes come with many, many, many more cores. So how do the user parallelize the workloads to make the most efficient use? What kind of software do they select to make the most efficient use? Uh, there's so many resources out there, but they, but they are potential wastage. Like I said, if you're only offering 120 core nodes and not one core nodes, users who don't need all those cores are wasting money and wasting resources, basically. The eviction events, if you do offer spot, they can be a little bit confusing at first. Uh, they, they confused us, actually, as IT people. So what's going on here? <laughs> but, so we had to put in place a lot of stuff, a lot of, lot of uh, process around them to manage them. But as, as I said, they are, I, in my opinion, they're very useful. They give very high discounts. They're really high, like I said, up to 80%. So that they do have their place in the whole uh, process. Uh, some of the some users like more resources than others. So although there are unlimited resources, well, potentially unlimited resources in the cloud, 
you will you will find a lot of demand in some of these areas. Uh, users sometimes they like Intel processors or AMD processors or ARM processors. Or, so they have their kind of favorites. So there might be some some partitions. This is kind of terminology we use. Maybe more in demand compared to others. Understand what's and help your user understand what's the best compute instances for them. Because uh, there's so, like I said, there's 400, over 400 compute instances. So it's very, can be very confusing for IT people. So for users, it's even more confusing what do they need to use and what's best for them, what's best for their workload. Try to do cost optimizing, optimize as much as possible your cost everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere you will find a ways to cost optimize and reduce costs and optimize your cost. And yeah, last but not least, keep up with the changes in Azure. Try to keep following, follow basically what's going on in Azure, keep keep up to date and uh, basically, yeah, just keep always watching and uh, uh, and following what's going on. Well, that's, that's my last slide. Hope that was useful. <laughs>